Hello everybody, we're going to get started. We're going to get started. If you can uh, silence your phones, do what you need to do to get ready. Put your phones away, please. Silence and away. Thank you. Well, thanks everyone for being here tonight. Um, I'll give you a second to quiet down, students. Thank you for being here. I know it's a long night for you all, so I especially appreciate it, but I think it'll be a good one for you as well. Um, welcome everyone, and thank you for being here again. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Marin Cobb, and I teach uh, US History and Race and Ethnicity America here at Shipley. Today has been a very special day for me. Um, I've had the privilege to introduce one of my life role models to my professional life here at Shipley. And I'm not sure if he knows this, but Dr. Hayter is a major reason why I even became a history teacher in the first place. I was a sheltered 19-year-old when I enrolled in my first course with Dr. Hayter, entitled Justice in Civil Society. And it was a course that quickly exposed me to the realities and injustices that permeate American society today. By interrogating both the theories and practices of justice, we examined how Americans have historically met the challenges of our society's most vulnerable communities. By asking key questions, such as how the inter interaction between so-called everyday people and the government continually changes the nature of our American democratic experience, we saw the history we thought we learned and knew through a new lens. Additionally, the course included community-based learning components designed to construct relevant and real connections between the classroom and our communities. Sorry about that. <laughs> Making the course pertinent to my life as a local and global citizen. And I don't mean to make this about me, but rather what I want you all to take away from this, especially the 120 kids in the room today, is that a professor and a class can have a profound impact on you. And so can a study that fuels your passions and what you care about. So notice that when it comes up and take advantage of that when you have the opportunities to do so. The subject matter that Dr. Hayter impassioned in me has informed the content that I teach here at Shipley every day. And in fact, the tension of equity and obligation are now more than ever at the forefront of our society. And it's critical to understand how history affects who we are today as Americans and even as members of the Shipley community. And I think Dr. Hayter will speak uh, to that specifically tonight in his presentation. Dr. Julian Hayter is an associate professor at um, University of Richmond of the Leadership Studies School, and he's a nationally renowned historian who has written and spoken extensively on the issues of race in America. His research focuses on modern US history, African American history, and urbanization. Dr. Hayter is the author of The Dream is Lost, Voting Rights and the, Political, uh, and the Politics of Race in Richmond, Virginia. And Hayter has been a thoughtful voice in the discussion of Confederate monuments, contributing to various national journals and media outlets. He was featured on Anderson Cooper's 60 Minutes, discussing, quote, the history and the future of Confederate monuments. And he sat in on, or was a major part of, the Monument Avenue Commission that actually dealt with uh, recommending how the city could add context to a monument avenue dedicated to six Confederate uh, monuments. He has a BA in history from the University of Washington, a master's and a PhD in American history from the University of Virginia, and we are grateful to have him here tonight, as am I uh, personally, and we want to welcome him here. Thank you. All right, uh, it's good to be here. Um, I just want to make sure I got all my stuff in order. Um, got my sweat rag. Uh, I'll take it back to church. Um, seriously. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, it, it really is an honor to be here um, with you, uh, young people, and not so young people. Um, 
Thank you for having me, Marin. Uh, thanks for asking me to come up. You know, I, I don't know. I, I miss this environment. Uh, believe it or not, I earned, as Marin said, I earned my PhD from the University of Virginia, but I actually wrote it in Los Angeles, California. And while finishing, I actually taught high school and middle school history um, at a prep school much like this called Flint Ridge Preparatory School right outside of Pasadena. I loved it. Um, in fact, I think about returning to, teach, uh, to teaching from time to time. And teaching history day in and day, day out made me a better historian. There's no doubt about that. Um, and I'd like to say this about this environment before I get going uh, with the slides. Don't forget to remember, you folks, what you're, especially the young people, what you're experiencing in this moment at the, an institution of this nature. Um, more specifically, uh, don't let the anxious pursuit of college admissions and careerism sour you on what really matters. What's here, right? It's that experiences shape experience. And this may sound ironic coming from a historian, uh, but try it as best you can um, before you get out of here to savor the here and now. Um, the ends will take care of themselves if you respect the means and if you respect the craft of what's going on here. And tonight I'm going to talk about craft, a brief history of history, if you will. Uh, not merely the craft of history, uh, but the craft of creating narrative. Um, historian Jacqueline Dowd Hall said that memory is as much a form of forgetting as remembering. Um, history is a deeply rooted political endeavor that often overly remembers some events at the expense of others. And in this way, Dowd Hall's quote begs us several questions of us. Namely, who decides what's remembered and forgotten? And more still, are memory and history the same things? I mean, how, what is history? Like, really? What is it, right? And before I add another word this evening, um, I'm ultimately suggesting that you question academic disciplines and their presentation of information. I'll tell you what history is not. It is not simply the past. It is, Michael Conway argued, quote, an attempt to memorialize and preserve the past. But it is not memory. Memories can serve as primary sources, but they do not stand alone as history. A history is essentially a collection of memories, analyzed, reduced into meaningful co conclusions. But that collection depends on the memories chosen, end quote. It's the very choice of memories and the omission of certain ones uh, that will occupy our endeavor this evening. You know, the search for his historical truth um, is a deeply contested matter. Uh, the power to define the past, uh, to shape narrative, is, believe it or not, a high-stakes game. Um, and that's the young lady who tragically lost her life at Charlottesville. And um, I think it becomes abundantly clear how much of a high-stakes game it is. I remember, well, I'm not a Southerner. I remember the first time I went to the South. We drove down Monument Avenue with my mother. And she said, whoever thinks losers don't write history has never driven down the street before. Right? It is a high-stakes game. But I'm going to spend some time in the North before we get back down to the South. We start in Philadelphia, by the way. Um, How does Philly remember its heroes, by the way? How does it do it? Um, and what does remembrance of those heroes say about the city's values? Malcolm Gladwell, Gladwell once said that monuments reflect something that people take seriously. Right? Well, what does Philly take seriously here? Right? Note the difference in the years between the Rocky and Fraser statues, right? The Rocky statue is commissioned in 1982. The Fraser statue is unveiled in 20. Um, 15, some years, by the way, after Joe Frazier beats Muhammad Ali. The, the city memorialized, with, with, not without controversy, I might add, a fictitious boxer before it erected a monument to a real one. Um, why? Uh, what is Philadelphia trying to remember? And what's the longstanding omission of an actual person? Tell us about the selection of memories, right? Just marinate on these for a while. By the way, this, this story isn't without deep irony. Uh, uh, Mike Todd, who actually directed a really good documentary on Joe Frazier, said, quote, the bitter irony of this is that the art museum steps were part of Joe's running route, right? He'd run through Fairmount Park and up the steps. That fictional character has a statue there and is, one of the, is the one remembered and for it is slightly strange, end quote. And I'm bringing this up for two reasons, right? Um, um, chiefly, there are similarities between the Rocky and Confederate statues. Not in the ways you might think, by the way. Numero uno, by the way, is that many Confederate statues, like Rock, the Rocky statue, were commissioned, paid for, 
and eventually occupied, or, or, or by private funds, but they occupied public space, right? The second is that we can measure what some people value by who gets celebrated and who does not, right? Frazier Pete Muhammad Ali, the greatest boxer ever, right, for the heavyweight title. And the city of Philadelphia failed to memorialize this man in statue until 2015. That's a strange juxtaposition. Let's imagine then that the story of Joe Frazier's memorialization parallels the story of African Americans in the United States. People that have been here since Jamestown and St. Augustine. The experience is not a footnote in American history. It's part of a complex collection of stories, right? Race, whether we like it or not, right, shaped the events that transpired right down the street at Independence Hall, right? It was the first time, it was the first great American compromise, right? And until we could bear the weight of it no longer, that led us to the Civil War. You know, writing people out of a narrative doesn't make it, these experiences any less real. Um, in fact, the sin of omission often piques curiosity, right? The, the statue of Rocky makes this omission of Frazier, I think, all the more curious. Um, in fact, when, we, when mythology masquerades as history, we run the risk of jeopardizing our distinctiveness. Um, be that character, person, or collective. This, this might seem like a bit of a digression, but uh, it was not, by the way, that's me up there. If you can't see, that's DNA over there, right? Um, we swore in my family there was Native American, like most African Americans. Like, oh, there's got to be some Native American buried in there somewhere to explain our complexion. Um, you know, let, let me tell you how, why I think this is relevant. This is it, it's fast. I think this recent de uh, this explosion in DNA testing is nothing short of fascinating. By the way, more specifically, right, many people aren't who they thought they were, and what we found is that more the science, the actual sources often flies in the face of the collection of family memories, the selective sources. DNA tests often belie how people remember, emphasize, and de-emphasize their family lineage and their stories. I mean, think about what it was like for Irish and new immigrants like Italians and Jews and Eastern Europeans in America during the late 19th century. One can imagine in a country based on immigration and migration that people married and had children and often chose not to emphasize ethnicities that weren't in vogue at any particular time. Right? That's the story in many ways of American history. Right? It's the story of not just of migration and enduring legacy um, and pluralism, but it's the story of misplaced emphasis, omissions, and exemptions. Think back to Frazier. What that means is if you ask the right questions about the long-standing absence of Joe Frazier's statue, those questions reveal a history of Philadelphia that you possibly never imagined. We are in many ways a country obsessed with history but we're also a country that struggles to tell its history and tell its story, right? What are, what are the reasons for this, right? This is, by the way, that's the naked history up there. Sorry for, uh, for the naked image, all right? This is actually a story about historiography and painting, right? Um, in fact, you know, I think history is far and away one of the worst taught subjects in, American K in the American K through 12 system. Um, since the beginning of compulsory education in the United States, we've often chosen to celebrate heritage rather than examine history. And while heritage is important, we often commemorate it at the expense of the complexity that define people. And before I get into trouble, by the way, I, I'm, not, I, I'm, certain, I'm, I'm not talking about Shipley, by the way. Um, and I mean that. I, I, I don't mean to imply that there aren't exceptional history teachers and historians at this level. There are. I just hung out with a lot of them. Um, but they're not the rule. Uh, and here's the real reason our history needs a facelift. In many places, not merely high schools that service vulnerable communities. The teaching of history is often left to people that haven't really studied history. Until very recently, it was left to coaches and social studies teachers, non-experts, and people that weren't generally interested in the discipline, which meant primarily that textbooks became law. And I'll get to this a bit more in a second, but imagine if we did this with math and science, right? Or the arts, or any of the other disciplines that people take seriously. Non-experts struggle to explain the whys and hows, right? Historiography, which is the cumulative effort of, of historians to interpret the past, right, was and is often left off the table in this equation. Um, yet, when the analytical tools that historians use to negotiate the past are removed from the process, when teachers refuse to interrogate the methods that historians use to develop history, it's no longer methodical, it's mythological. And in this country, where the selection of memories has profound implications for power relationships, this is a serious endeavor. Right? Are there historical facts? Absolutely, by the way. We all know that the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. Why, however, murky. And we need to embrace the uncertainties of why. And um, 
<coughs> Charlottesville debacle was really about who gets to define the why. The actual story of the Lee Monument in Charlottesville is one such example. In March of 2016, someone your age, by the way, your age, a then 15-year-old African-American freshman named Deanna Bryant petitioned the city council to remove the statue of General Lee in what is now Emancipation Park. The council obliged, and an assortment of white nationalists set out to generate momentum for their cause by opposing the statue's removal. Bryant told Vice in February of 2018, quote, it wasn't until fifth or sixth grade when we started learning about the Civil War that I started to really understand. Everything that they taught us at school about the Civil War was so romanticized. So I decided to do my own research, which is something my family always encouraged me to do. Once I learned the truth about slavery in the Civil War, I felt disgusted that my city wanted to display a statue that celebrated my ancestors' pain." End quote. In scrutinizing how the Lee Monument came to be, Bryant was actually questioning how and why history is told. A 15-year-old delved into affairs not just of history, but historiography and history education. And in doing so, she not only ignited the battle for Charlottesville's soul, but she ignited one of the most profound debates in modern American memory about history. She also demonstrated in this debate that America's inability to grapple with its tortured racial history has educational implications. Bryant's quest also spotlighted a serious flaw in our history education. Most students in the United States learn history as an established linear narrative, right? A uh, set of facts that point toward progress. The advanced placement system has rushed generations of students through vital portions of American history. Uh, some of this is pedagogical fashion, uh, but some of this is about an acute lack of imagination that defines path-dependent approach we've taken to college entry, right? Um, and that's not exclusively the, the, the fault of high schools, by the way. Um, worse still, the teaching of history often urges rote memorization over investigating the process of writing history history and historical narratives and recognizing how inherent biases shape conventional instructional materials. What we're really talking about is critical thinking here, right? There's no better example of how bias shapes history than the lost cause of the Confederacy. By the way, if you look at this, uh, here's a graph outlining Confederate moral memorialization over the last 155 years. Notice the protrusions, by the way. Notice the corresponding years that you see when the South built most of these statues, right? You see a, um, a, a, an explosion in between 1900 and 1920, and then you see another explosion during the Civil Rights Movement. Um, while the lost cause emerged immediately after the Civil War, the Confederate memorialization was a Jim Crow phenomenon. If these statues in this timeline reflect anything, it's the anxiety of a postbellum world where 666,000 people died defending an oligarchic system that had total control over Southern life, right? And it's pretty well established that the master-servant relationship in the South dictated all things Southern, from politics to gendered norms, economics onto Southern culture, and despite the fact that no, no more than half Southerners owned slaves, right? And this carries over. We talk about segregation, but we rarely boil it down in real terms. Besides mandated racial separation, here's what it actually was. Right? Powerful men used the law to reassert control over not just freed slaves, but the Southern way of life. And to this end, they devised laws that essentially reaffirmed control over black and white labor forces. And in doing so, they solidified economic, political, and social power for most of the 20th century. So much so that black Americans, if you really boil it down, were not full citizens of the United States until 1965, especially in the South. And Jim Crow, in this way, represents the reestablishment of oligarchy with new players. Take Virginia, right? The Constitutional Convention in Virginia in 1901 and 1902 enacts poll taxes and other anti-voting device, anti devices. And this happens throughout the South at the turn of the 20th century. In doing so, right, this Constitutional Convention robs 80% of African Americans of the right to vote for most of the 20th century. But here's a dirty little secret. It also robbed 50% of whites of the right to vote, too, by the way. Um, this anti-democratic face of Jim Crow segregation had even graver implications. V Virginia had the lowest voter turnout rate in the United States and one of the lowest voter turnout rates of any country in the free world for most of the 20th century. What does that mean for Southern memory, right? It means that Confederate statues may have been funded with public money, but they were erected without a popular mandate. In fact, it meant that for most of the 20th century, state and local laws were governed by a very small number of men. 
If you think about Jim Crow through the lens of democracy instead of race, I mean, think about that. We often think about it as race. We just think about it as a democratic exercise in political power. Remove the race if you can, just for a second. If you remove race from it, segregation's nearly 100 year history is even more sordid, right? Especially in a country that continually positions itself in the center of freedom. So how did these guys get people to buy into such an exclusive system? Why would so many people willing to submit to a system that actually worked for so few? You'll never get to the bottom of that question, by the way, um, without asking uh, some serious questions about what segregation actually was. One, one has to ask how racial considerations have eclipsed other interests throughout American history, and there's probably no better way to do this than to look at the lost cause. By the way, that's the, that statue, that's the Jefferson Memorial in Richmond, Virginia. It still, sits, it still sits there to this day. So what was the lost cause? Right, the lost cause is an interpretation of the American Civil War that seeks to present the war from the perspective of Confederates in the best possible terms, right? It developed, it's developed by white Southerners, many of them former Confederate generals, in a post-war climate of economic, racial, and social uncertainty. The Lost Cause created that romanticized the Old South in the Confederate war effort, often distorting history in the process. Secession, not slavery, cause of wars. One thing they put up, blacks were faithful and happy slaves. Soldiers were heroic. Lee was the most heroic of the soldiers, but most importantly, the South was destined to lose because the North had advantages in resources and men. Ultimately, though, segregationists put forward the notion that heroic leaders and soldiers were simply defending Southern heritage from Northern aggression, and they depicted slavery as a dying and benign institution. Neither is true, by the way. And we know this by looking up historical records in lieu of mythologizing about the past. I'll return to this in a second. Uh, here's why it resonates to this day, and it's found its way into Charlottesville. The problem of teaching history and how history is made is nothing new. Again, take Virginia. And note that history, that this history was a southern rule rather than the exception. Generations of boomers learned American history in textbooks that were commissioned by the Commonwealth in 1957, the height of massive resistance to public school integration. These commissions were common during Jim Crow. A recent analysis of these textbooks, these are two examples of those, that were in those textbooks, um, revealed any number of historical inaccuracies twisted to defend segregation. I mean, look at the picture on the left, by the way. Are you kidding me? That's a picture of the Middle Passage in a textbook where people are meeting. Look at how these people are dressed. I don't know if you can read what it says here, but I'll read it for you. It says, early in Virginia history, the General Assembly made laws closely controlling the Negroes. However, the laws were not fully enforced. Many slave masters did not like to have the state government meddle in what they considered their private. I, can, I understand that, right? But they managed the servants according to their own methods. They knew the best way to control their slaves was to win their confidence and affection. Many Negroes were taught to read and write. Many of them were allowed to meet in groups for preaching, for funerals, and for singing and dancing. They went visiting at night and sometimes owned guns and other weapons. And this is apparently how they greeted one another um, uh, when they met, right? <laughs> This is a picture of Mount Vernon, by the way. Uh, that's George Washington. This is the same seventh grade textbook. And it depicted this painting of George Washington overseeing his slaves at Mount Vernon. And the caption read, and I quote, right, that Virginia offered a better life for Negroes than did Africa, right? You can't make this stuff up. Um, <laughs> well, well, apparently you can. Um, right? The Richmond Times Dispatch recently analyzed these textbooks, and the one of which was the Cavalier Commonwealth, right? And these are some of the more egregious examples, but there are all kinds of benign portrayals of this institution uh, throughout these. Systems. One was, right, the slave did not work so hard as the average free laborer, uh, and since he did not have to worry about losing his job, in fact, the slave enjoyed what we might call comprehensive social security, right? How's that, the macro, right? Generally speaking, his food was plentiful, his clothing adequate, his cabin warm, his health protected and his leisure carefree. Slave owners and slaves understood that bondage as they knew it was not totally evil. Both realized that enslavement in a civilized world had been better in many respects for the Negro than the barbarities he might have suffered in Africa. Lee, of course, as the consummate paternalist, the protector of the first two, came as close to any man as fulfilling the best ideals of what a Virginian gentleman should be. These are just a handful of the distortions these books put forward. Um, and go back and read some of these old textbooks. They're nothing short of remarkable. You guys are the benefactors of some really good historical research, right? Let's assume for a second that hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Americans were raised on this stuff, right? Let's, right? And I also think it's safe to assume that these texts were confirmed by out-and-out -out racial hostility in some people's homes, 
right? I think it's, right, I'm not looking to indict historical actors here, y'all, right? The history speaks for itself. American racism in the mid 20th century was common sense, right? It's how people made sense of the world. We know the same thing is true for the legacy of anti Semitism in Europe, right? And I'm bringing this up because the Holocaust was a watershed moment in moving us towards human rights. Anti Semitism across the Atlantic had been around in explicit and implicit ways for centuries. To imply, by the way, that anti Semitism was a 20th century creation is not just ahistorical. It belies the legacy of anti Judaism in Europe that made Nazism possible in the first place. The Nazis industrialized anti Semitism, they didn't create it. Segregation is codified and normalized white supremacy. They didn't create it. But both groups manipulated information to serve their respective political ends. And, and history was their chief mechanism. And it also turns out, by the way, and I can talk a little bit more about this in Q&A if you're interested, that the Nazis actually borrowed directly from segregationists. Um, in some ways, it was the memory of the Holocaust that not only inspired a generation of historians to question segregation, the civil rights movement urged these historians farther to move away from those depictions that I just showed you. As African Americans organized to do battle with second class citizenship, really smart people began to recognize that there's something deeply troubling about these benign and not so benign depictions of African Americans in these textbooks. Right? And this is what they found, among other things. They not only took the lost cost to task, here's what they found by looking at actual sources. Right? The slaves were often sickly, i.e., dysentery, typhoid, hepatitis, infant mortality rates, worms, tetanus, you name it. And they constantly challenged the boundaries. Look at medical records, right? And they constantly challenged the boundaries of the master-servant relationship. Historians generally agree that slavery, more than any other issue, brought on the war. Even a cursory search of the University of Richmond's visitation of the Virginia Secession Convention demonstrates just this: the word slavery comes up 512 times. The word states' rights comes up mere 29 times, right? Historical documents demonstrate that Lee's benevolence as a slave master on the plantation that is now in our city is deeply questionable, right? Um, before its construction in 1890. Virginia's Governor Fitzhugh Lee, who was actually General Lee's nephew, not only refused to build Richmond's uh, Lee statue on Capitol grounds, he openly referred to Monument Avenue as a, as a naked and plain business deal, as a real estate ploy, right? What's most disheartening as a historian is not the history, right? It's that it persists. Um, mid, mid 20th century textbooks not only were, weren't phased out until the 1970s, and the textbooks that replaced the textbooks that were phased out in the late 1970s that weren't, weren't that much better, right? This legacy of historical interpretation continues to drive American nostalgia, and it lingers today in debates over Confederate monuments, right? A fair number of boomers over the age of 55, and their children, I might add, came equipped to debates after Charlottesville and Richmond, armed with lost cause talking points about the Civil War. It couldn't have been about black people. It had to be about states' rights. Um, and when it's all said and done, Confederate monuments were one example of the fiendishly covetous ways Southern politicians and profiteers use racial identity, urban development, and Confederate memory to cement their own economic and political power. Built by African Americans and whites alike, these statues sought to justify a political system in the present by rewriting history. The leaders that proliferated Confederate symbolism were often the orchestrators and the adjudicators and the proprietors of Jim Crowism. They rewrote state constitutions during the early 20th century to harden the color line ultimately benefiting their own bottom line. It was truly cynical, without vision, by the way. Think back to the timeline and the proliferation of Confederate symbols that emerged during the Civil Rights Movement. Confederate symbolism became as essential to segregation in the public space as the white-only signs that saturate popular imagery of segregation. So what does this all mean? The French scholar Alexis de Tocqueville in Democracy in America told us what it meant in 1835. It was Tocqueville who said America had two choices. It could manumit its slaves and treat them with some degree of dignity, or it could perpetuate their serfdom for as long as possible. The Jim Crow segregation demonstrates, demonstrates the choice that Americans made, right? And those textbooks are the rationalization for those choices. In fact, it was Tocqueville who said that the possibility of broad-based democracy has always heightened rather than alleviated anxiety in America, doubly so for African Americans. Again, thinking of the timeline, those statues always went up during either economic anxiety or racial permissiveness, right? It was Frazier and other people that came to Philadelphia trying to escape that. It's a migrant story. It's an immigrant story, right? And in 1910, right? Oh, yeah. I forgot that slide. Sorry about that. Um, in 1910, historian Frederick Jackson Turner argued it is a familiar doctrine that each age studies its history anew. 
and with interest determined by the spirit of the time. Good historians and sound histories must acknowledge multiple interpretations of events, grapple with causality, negotiate uncertainty, and above all, rely on the foundation of evidence to draw conclusions. Those who seek to reimagine the meaning of Confederate monuments and Southern history recognize that there was something deeply troubling about the mid 20th century's history. Recently, critics of history used the word revisionism to discredit the discipline of history. More specifically, they contend that modern historians are revising history to fit a narrow political and liberal vision. And some are, by the way. Yet all scholars bring their biases to bear on the scientific process. In the right circumstances, however, evidence reinforms those biases. And more still, theories are retested with more evidence. The fact of the matter is, all history is revisionist. All of it is. Historians use the historical method, the negotiation of sources and other materials, to interpret things that have already happened. These are fundamentally revisionist endeavors. Our, our experiences shape the way we imagine events. Right? Acknowledging this reality is an essential step to, toward objectivity. Yet some would have us believe that the first history of the United States were correct simply because they were written first. And it stands to reason that a good number of historians and a good number of scholars were incapable about writing about sensitive issues like race objectively before the 1950s. So they too revised the historical record to fit their worldview without nuance and without intricacy. I mean, does anyone in this room honestly believe, honestly, that Confederates and segregationists and neo-Confederates were and are capable of writing objective histories about slavery, about the South, about its African Americans, about the Civil War, about race relations? Really, when ideology shapes scientific inquiry instead of evidence, you're in bad shape. Um, those textbooks I just delineated put forward a brand of propaganda in the true sense of the word, right? It was information, especially of a biased and misleading nature, used to promote and publicize a particular political cause. That we're even calling the revision of Confederate history of revisionism is deeply ironic, right? Unquestionably, Turner argued further in 1910, each investigator and writer is influenced by the times in which he lives. And while this fact exposes the historian to a bias, at the same time, it affords him new instruments and insights for dealing with his subject. This is why Bryant challenged the Lee Monument. Not to rewrite history, per se. That had already been done. But to challenge a distorted history. I mean, can we learn from those distortions? Absolutely, we've got to, right? They're real history. And I'm not advocating that we erase that history or those textbooks. I'm urging us to understand them within their proper historical context. While many disagree, including me, right, with the hasty removal of these monuments, uh, that Brian raised these disagreements while, teach while teaching while the teaching of history in the Southern School reveals just how deeply embedded in this, the nostalgia of the Confederacy is in the American public consciousness. Even after nearly 60 years of sound historical research, we're still stuck on this, despite those textbooks, right? Look, our generation, too, brings its biases to bear on the historical process. And in many cases, over six decades of sound historical research and literature have influenced these preconceptions. Think of Frazier. Adding Joe Frazier to the multitude of memorials that characterize this great city is it some half-baked attempt at vindicationism. It is an attempt to do due diligence to the real story of Philadelphia. It is an attempt to atone not just for the sin of omission, but for deep historical bias. I understand why a city like Philly refused to honor Joe Frazier for so many years. Perhaps there's something in Frazier's story that reminds Philadelphia of a passing of people that would rather forget, right? Of that old Independence Hall compromise over slavery or Tocqueville's perpetuation of serfdom, the experience of black Americans in the North which is in many ways an immigrant story, often belies the American dream. But that's another lecture, right? My question then is this. How does a country, a city, an organization, a person, measure progress if they refuse to acknowledge where they began, right? So here you are, young folks, anew, set to begin with the ideas that are uppermost in your time, right? Many of us know better now. And therefore, we're charged to challenge the lousy assumptions of previous generations and build upon their more accurate conclusions. Because in the end, someone once argued, history, like humanity, is anything but agreeable. It's a collection of facts deemed, it's not a collection of facts, rather, of, of deemed by officials on high. It's a collection of histories exchanging different and often conflicting analyses. And rather than vainly seeking to transcend the inevitable clash of memories, American students would be better served by descending into the bog of conflict and learning the many histories that compose this great national story. We should do this again and again, 
right? It's what makes the human condition so damn magical that we persist, right, despite our differences. In the end, folks, people have lived and died on this planet believing in things that we now know are patently false. Many of the things that we believe will be proven wrong by unanticipated discoveries and the curiosities of future generations. My ultimate point is don't take any of this stuff at face value. You're a critical component of crafting stories by using critical thinking skills. If you ask the right questions, it means you'll justify the ends. You've inherited the sins of previous generations, but you're also the benefactors of some brilliant stuff too. Thank you. Are we micing up? I just had to do the double mic thing. It's right, I feel like twice DMC, right? Um, uh, uh, yeah, I'll answer. I'll, I'll answer questions. Yes. We said pretty much all of this, right? We tried to contextualize the monuments within um, the context in which they were built and without mythology. So what do you do? You go to the sources. It's like, what did people have to say about those monuments when they were constructed? And what were they intending? Which is real history, by the way. And we said, well, if you read there in black and white, they're pretty much telling you what they were trying to do. That's why the Fitz Hall Lee um, statement is so, uh, is so profound, right? because he was pretty explicit about the fact that they were trying to build a neighborhood around the mythology of the, of the lost cause. Right? It was a naked real estate pool. And what we said was, you have to do due diligence in the context in which those monuments were built. Not just by taking people what they said at face value, right? but by thinking about the kind of larger implications of Southern history in the late 19th and early 20th century. But we came to a conclusion about the Jefferson Davis monument. So the, the, the rationalization of Virginians is that all those guys on Monument Avenue um, are Virginians. But Davis isn't. He's probably, and, and, and all the statues on Monument Avenue stand without context. There, there's very little written on them, with the exception of Davis. It is the most uh, nakedly lost cause in its, in its language around the monument. And so the commission eventually said if there is a statue that's that is to be taken down, it was the recommendation that it would be the Jefferson Davis statue and then relocate it somewhere else. Uh, but ultimately, I think what we wanted to do is we recognized that um, many people don't know the story of Jim Crow. Many people don't associate the creation of Confederate monuments with Jim Crow segregation. They think it's about slavery the Civil War. But in many issues, in many ways, it's about Jim Crow. So maybe what we owe people, maybe what we owe future generations is an explicit story about the context in which those monuments were built in the first place. Is that recontextualization going to be controversial? Absolutely. right? But it's better than what's there now. So that's where we ended up. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Would the idea of putting them, say, in a museum uh, work? That's been on the table, right? So that's what has come up with the Jeff Davis monument, right? Problem with Virginia is they knew this day was coming. If you, if you read the language in the law, there is more written about how you cannot t touch these, many of these statues than there is in the actual Constitution itself, right? They knew y'all they knew were coming for them 100 years ago, by the way. And they baked it into the law that Right? And, uh, and in fact, the city of Richmond has no jurisdiction over the Lee Monument. It's, it's under the purview of the state. So it's it, even all, despite our recommendations, you need an explicit mandate from the General Assembly to touch that monument. Right? They, they were smart. I think that's one of the assumptions about Southerners is that they're not, they're not sharp, right? Because of the drawl and, you know. But they've been crafting some pretty interesting laws uh, since laws have been crafted in the United States. And, um, the protections that they have over those monuments are just one example. So it's been difficult, right? That's why, the, it's also, by the way, why you see some of these monuments being removed in the dead of night, right? You, I think this is the Baltimore did this, right? They literally snuck in in the dead of night. And, but have you ever seen Monument Avenue? You, you can't take those statues down in the dead of, you're gonna need a bulldozer. They're huge. They are literally tens of feet tall. Um, so it's gonna be hard in many ways. It's, prob it, it is, it's actually a sight to behold if you've never seen it before um, in, in, in scale and grandeur. And 
in that way, it, you cannot devise strategies around Monument Avenue that you did in other places in large part because Virginians were extremely adept and making sure that those monuments can be hard to take down. Right. My man. Um, I read that uh, on Monument Avenue, along with like, a lot of uh, Confederate figures, there's a statue of Arthur. There is. So I'm curious your opinion on that. Uh, it's, it's been, it was controversial, by the way. So the Arthur Ashe statue goes up in the late 1990s. Uh, forgive me for how I'm going to say this, but there's really no way. That, as a kind of proverbial middle finger to all the other statues. Right? And um, it's actually, it's, I don't, it's, it's, I, do you, do you know why? Do you all know why Arthur Ashe is on Monument Avenue? Yeah, who, first of all, how many of you don't know who? It's okay, by the way. Who doesn't know who Arthur Ashe is? He's one of the greatest tennis players in American history, right? Not just in Africa. I just, I'm, I'm glad I asked that, by the way, <laughs> right before I go up. He's one of the greatest tennis players in American history, and um, he is African American and he's from the city of Richmond, Virginia. He was accidentally given HIV AIDS in a blood transfusion in the late 1980s and he died, right? Um, it's a tragic story, but he was a very graceful man and they decided to build a statue to him. It's probably one of the least controversial statues on Monument Avenue, right? Um, it's particularly in relationship to the other ones. There, was, there were plenty of people who did not want it there. There are still people who don't want it there. Um, but it's one that Richmonders universally agree should probably be there. African Americans put that in, right? Uh, all uh, predominantly African American city council came and put that monument in um, during the late 1990s. So they, they knew what they were doing. Yeah. That's right. 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 Um, but they're still up because they're respected from it. So it's like say the meaning of these statues being rather than being like the the closest. There's all kinds of things. Yeah, like it could be the change to like on like honoring his uh, military tactics. That's what the that's in fact what the people who defend those argue those monuments say they're there for. They say, they argue that they're war memorials. Right? They say, oh this is a war memorial. It has nothing to do with anything else. Don't touch it, right? So if that's been done, that's a great, that's a great point, right? Yeah. Um, what about redesigning? Are you opposed to? It? I'm not necessarily opposed to it, I, right? Why do you prefer recontextualize? Because I'm a historian, <laughs> right? Hammer nail, right? You know, I, yeah, that's why. Because I think the history is going to the the understanding of the politics that led to those monuments. Right? You'd be surprised how many people don't really understand the story. Right? Most people think those monuments were built during the Civil War. Right? Monuments to Stalinism were built by Stalinists. Monuments to Nazism were built by Nazis. Confederate monuments were built by the posterity of Confederates. Right? So in that way, they're different. Um, they were built during Jim Crow. They were not built during the regime. They were built after the regime fell as a way to polish up what the regime stood for. And in that way, I think it's more nuanced. I can understand why people want them taken down. Right? But I, I'll just throw this at you. Most of this debate came about as a result of the events that took place in South Carolina when Dylan Roof walked into the church and shot those folks. Right? And the woman climbs up the flagpole and she takes down the, 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 the uh, stars and bars. And, I, and, and the political symbolism of that moment was, was absolutely profound. But is South Carolina any more or less South Carolina after that flag came down than it was before? It looked good. But it sounds like that's pretty much what it was before, right? I think what happens is people end up celebrating the moments of taking things down without actually trying to understand the politics that led to their erection in the first place, very complicated and complex histories um, that, that led to their maintenance and so on and so forth. So I think, you know, I'm always going to advocate for education. Um, that can happen in a lot of ways, right? But I think the, the risk you run um, in, in tearing monuments down, in some ways what it, what it can do uh, it, not, it can not only lead to, to more detractors, but, it, but you can wash away very valuable history that might preclude those things from happening again, right? Yes? So to that point, what are your textbooks like today? Much better. Fascinating. Do they still need improvement? They're going to, they will always, but, 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 because like, things change. Like unforeseen things like change how textbooks are written. 
the mapping of the human genome has changed textbooks, textbooks in ways that historians could have never foreseen. I have no idea how textbooks are going to change because we can wake up tomorrow, somebody can do something really profound, like that has nothing to do with history. And we're like, oh my God, we got to have to go back and rewrite all this text. We were dead wrong. The cure of cancer was hiding in some tree in the Amazon, right? We didn't know. I don't know, right? But, but of course, right? But that's the process. The process is the constant amending of knowledge. Not that, uh, and, and, what, and that's why I was very specific to say there are historical facts, right? But our interpretation of them changes based on these discoveries that we make. But the, the, I guess the, the question I'm asking is the facts that are known that have been omitted. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a different matter, right? The, the economic value of Africans that were brought here. Right. Right. Well, some of them are, some textbooks are better than others. By the way, people say the controversy in Texas means so much, right? Because Texas is a big state. Because there's so many textbooks, they then, in, it's not about Texas at all. It's about the fact that Texas has a lion's share of market value in textbook production, right? And the nature in which they're writing textbooks have a profound influence on the nature and the types of histories people are going to consume. So you have to be very careful, right? There, there are culture wars still going on to this day that, it, that, that influence the nature and way that history is told. Um, it's still going on, absolutely. But I do think that there is more, hit, more good history in circulation now than there has ever been, right? One more time. Sure. Who's making those Historians. Well, it's about what goes into textbooks? Publishers, historians, right? Scholars, uh, teachers, academic administrators, you name it, right? Um, unfortunately, I think, in instances where people are deciding what to omit from this, it's, deep, it's deeply politicized, right? Yeah, it's unfortunate. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering. Um, I can't hear you. All right. Um, uh, you said that uh, all history is like revisionist. Yep. Right. Well, we know Abraham Lincoln was shot. Well, yeah. Right. Remembering how he was shot is. The, the portion that's where historical facts aren't necessarily revisionist. But if we think of history as a collection of memories and analysis of those memories, that is fundamentally re If I literally, if I took this microphone and heaved it across the room, right, I wouldn't do that, right? But everyone would have a different opinion of this microphone's trajectory based on their position in this room, right? So just think of history as like the trajectory of that microphone, right? So there, we, we are thinking about the trajectory of that microphone based on where we're at. But if we acknowledge where we're at in the room, Right? Then everybody knows where we're at in the room, so we bring those biases to bear on the trajectory of the microphones. You follow me on this? You sure? Because I'm not sure I'm following myself. Okay. Yes. Uh huh. Uh, but uh, how was that around the time of the UDC? Yep, United Nations Confederacy were responsible for a lot of these statues, young man. Right? Ab absolutely. They funded many of them. How do you think history would have been like the fact that they didn't themselves show the statues? They probably wouldn't be there. Right? Um, United Nations Confederacy played a huge part in the in Confederate memorialization. Right? And they had an axe to grind. And, and, and listen, I know this is going to sound strange, right? But you have to think what the loss of 660,000 people meant to America at that moment. It's more people who lost the Second World War, by the way. By um, doubled, almost doubled, right? It devastated the South, right? And whether or not, you, you can disagree with the United Daughters of the Confederacy, but you have to understand that they lost loved ones too. I disagree with them, right? And they were trying to make sense of that loss. Right? And it was, it, it was extremely hard for them to make sense of that loss, given the racial considerations that they brought to bear on the conversation at the time. Right? So they bring their biases to bear on Confederate memorialization in a way that seems intolerably anachronistic to us. Right? Egregious, in fact, and um, ahistorical. But they were real people with real ideas. And those ideas, um, as, uh, as appalling as they may seem to many of us, uh, led to those statues, and they were almost single-handedly responsible for many of the statues that went up throughout the South. That's a great question. Yeah. Um, you talk a lot about, like, Confederate statues in the South, and, like, that's where you know, the 
Because they, they fought there. But I think people view the Confederate statues, that's a great point. I think people view the Confederate statues at Gettysburg as true war memorials, right? Whereas many Confederate statues are um, in public spaces, right, for very different reasons. I think, in fact, if you look at Monument Avenue in Richmond, Virginia, there is not one, there is not one monument honoring Confederate soldiers. It's all leaders. What you see in Gettysburg are monuments honoring Confederate soldiers that fought and died um, uh, for the war. And I think people view those um, more in keeping with what you were talking about is reframing them as war memorials than they do anywhere else. So I think that's why they're tolerated at Gettysburg in ways that they are in other spaces. Yeah. Um, I know I asked in class. Could do it again. They, in many ways, they did, right? It, the, the South won. How did they not? They lost the war, right? But they were pretty much able to re, reimagine that region in the image of uh, the post-13th Amendment image that they wanted to craft. It's, it, it, it's, the argument has been made um, that given the nature in which uh, Confederate memorialization and Jim Crow lasted until 1965, you can make a pretty convincing case that they still exerted a profound influence, not over the home rule, but over the federal government well into the 20th century. You can say they won, right? You can say they won. By the way, you, you should write that up and, and then send it off for your college and people, all the professors, you'll be, you'll be the man. Like, this kid is brilliant, right? <laughs> right? right? <laughs> yes? Uh, yeah. But they don't, by the way, depending on where you're at. There's a lot more, but well, let, let me be very specific. There's a lot more Native American history in textbooks than there was 30 years ago, because there was none. I mean, I talked to my mom about this. I mean, it was amazing. You talk to, like, my mother is like, she's 66 now. There was nothing in those, in those history textbooks about Native Americans, African Americans, and other individuals. It just didn't exist. It was not there. The sin of omission was actually very palpable. And I think what we found is there's been this anxious pursuit over the last 50 years to not diversify these textbooks for the sake of diversity, but to diversify the textbooks for the sake of doing the narrative due diligence, right? So while we still have a long ways to go in adding Native American stories to textbooks, I think we're on the right path. Oh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> right. Sure. Trump holds a meeting with like the leaders of the Native Americans in our country. Uh, he's part of an Andrew Jackson portrait. Right. He comes in the decimal. Right. I, I, it's one of those. It's you know. It's it's a. It, you you have to in some ways think about what happened in the front. It's one of the reasons why frontier history is so touchy. It's so controversial. Right? Because it's impossible to recognize manifest destiny. It's impossible to recognize westward expansion without coming to the conclusion that there were people out. I just drove to Seattle, by the way, as a post-genius celebration. My father passed away, and I got this Camaro, so I revved it up, and I drove to Seattle backwards and forward. You, you'd be hard-pressed to find Native Americans even out there to this day. They're not. They're, when's the last time any of us have seen Native Americans just hanging out? Right? They're gone. Right? So I think you do have to think about that. But the, the real question that a historian would ask is how do people rationalize what happened? We know what happened. How do people make sense of what happened? What types of ideologies do people use to rationalize? It's the same question we asked in the class about Columbus. Somebody said, we're going to take something. Why not take the Columbus statue now? Right? What do we do with that? Well, the best thing you can do, and this is what uh, uh, I can't remember, uh, the Penn State shirt. Um, the best thing you can do. First of all, before you start tearing things down, it's like, what types of frameworks did Columbus think about to rationalize the stuff they were doing in the West Indies? That's where the beauty is in the argument. It's like, whoa, wow, this is fascinating how they thought about the world. How did the framers think about the world in a way that helped them rationalize the brutalities that they inflicted on Native American peoples? And not just the frontier, but all throughout this area. Right? And at one point, there were Native Americans all up and down this coast. Right? Um, and I think that's where the real rubber meets the road. It's deeply problematic. You're absolutely right. And I think you have to reinterrogate the legacies of many of these great men um, within that context. Yeah? You know, like, I just, like, we kind of consider, like, people who are, I mean, we stereotype the Confederacy as racist, and I get why. 
Sure. Horrible. Sure. Crazy. Can we mold these presidents the same job? I think the difference, I said this in 60 minutes, the big difference between Thomas Jefferson and George Washington and men like Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis is as troubled, as complicated as Thomas Jefferson was. We know about his relationships with slaves, right? Monticello does a much better job about the, the, the role Thomas Jefferson played as a slave owner, right? Thomas Jefferson, for all the things he did, built as much as he destroyed, right? As Thomas Jefferson and George Washington, as troublesome as, as they were in some ways, many of their times, built and baked into the Constitution the apparatus that allowed people to disestablish the slave system, right? It's tr and I am not trying to take away from the problematic legacy of those men. I cannot say the same thing for the Confederacy. I can't, that, right? They destroyed way more than they built, right? And the 660,000 people that died in that war are evidence of how much they destroyed. Right? So I think one of the hardest things to negotiate with people are the granularities. Right? We, we, we're we're, we're leader-centric and we hero worship. You either are all bad or you're not. I do this with King all the time Right? when I teach the civil rights movement. It's hard for people to come to the conclusion that Martin Luther King, when he died, had a problem with alcohol and he's a womanizer, by the way. Right? Does that take anything away from all the profound things that that man did over the course of his life? I think people struggle, not only individually in dealing with their own demons, we, we definitely deal with our heroes, right? But it makes the history much more rich. I think the history is richer when we deal with people and their complexities. Yeah. Did I ask you a question? Yeah, I mean, I just, I mean, we're all, I mean, I don't know, I mean, in my class, especially we're learning a lot about the American, what really happened. Right. It's just, I mean, we can't hold everyone to the same value, I get that. Right. But it's just, it's, it's, it's devastating. It kills me. Right. It's devastating. But, no, no, no. You don't have to apologize, man. Yeah. I think they're teachable. That's why. Right? Uh, by the way, I, I am definitely not going to capitulate to laziness as an excuse not to contextualize those monuments. So, like, what I said was what you could do, right, around the Lee Monument, which is a circle, and there are four points. You could get big glass, I said this on 60 minutes, you could take big glass placards, right, that when you look through them, you actually see the monuments, but actually those placards are, are words. Like, on one of them could be all the people that Lee owned, all the slaves, you, like, the, like the Vietnam Memorial. So it's impossible not to view that man as a slave owner he was. Then you circle around on the next one, and it talks about the context in which that monument, you walk away from that monument with a firmer understanding of the very complicated nature and the context that led to the construction of that monument in the first place, but also the romanticized nature what people would like you to envision, right? How could that not, in some ways, um, make us all better off than, I think, just move, removing it, right? By the way, I'm not saying that has to last. I think eventually, future generations will probably render those monuments obsolete, right? Um, but I think the rendering of those monuments as obsolete is made much easier through it, with information than with, with just removal. I think the removal, we've seen what happened. I mean, we've seen this throughout Europe, by the way. The, um, the Germans and, and people in Eastern Europe still use many of the, these, these deeply troublesome places where the Holocaust was executed to teach a story about how? It's like, for, I, I don't want to digress, but I, I think I, I'm going to try to use this to circle back to your question. It's easy when you think about what happened during the Second World War to think about Nazism and the Holocaust through the lens of a handful of very powerful individuals, right? But what Holocaust memory has actually done by keeping those places up to show how information manipulation, economic anxiety turned everyday people into monsters. Right? And that's the real story of the Holocaust. Right? And I think in some ways that's what people are trying to do with Confederate memorialization. Is to say, what, it's not just about these leaders. It's about the people who built them and their manipulation of information. What are they trying to do? What story are they trying to tell us? And for what reason? And I think that's, and in that is a much more enriching story, not just about history, but about the ways that people use information to try to manipulate the masses. And I think we can walk away with a very profound sense of, of collective identity if we actually do due diligence to the history once and for all. Because we have, you know, it's like, I always say you can't have reconciliation without recognition. 
But there's been no real moment of unity in the United States. So you can't have conciliation without recognition. I think that's a critical step to the atonement process in this country. The one thing I will say about the Germans, there is a collective sense of guilt in that country about the Holocaust that doesn't exist in the United States about the things that he just articulated and all the things that I put up on that slide board. And I think we've got to get there. I, I don't think we will truly heal as a country until we do. Yeah. Yeah. I can't hear you. Stand up. Hi. I remember you. Hi. <laughs> Right. Sure. Right. Like in all of the different Right. That's my uh, that's my footnote. Is is that contextualization is deeply troubles. It's hard. Who gets to decide how you contextualize? It's it you're, that's a great question. We don't know that yet. We haven't tried it. I wish I had a more sophisticated answer for you. It's a great question. I'm not sure, by the way. But I do know that given the nature in which things have shaken out in recent months, in recent years, those, those monuments can no longer stand there without context in the manner they do. Right? Yes? I know Sure. Sure. You know what? One of the things we found on the Monument Commission that might surprise you, museums don't want them. <laughs> right? Right? They don't want them. We were like, hey, maybe we can put a museum. They're like, put it in ours. Right? They don't want them. Right? What if we, so this is, uh, so this is, the, this is the deal with the, the bargain we made. What if we begin to think of cities as museums? Right? So what we're trying to do in Richmond now, for instance, is have this kind of yellow brick road approach to the monuments where you deal with the slave trade. But very few people know this about the city of Richmond, by the way. Um, it was the second biggest slave trading city behind New Orleans in the United States. The term being sold down the river comes from Richmond. After, the t after automation and tobacco production meant that you didn't need as many slave hands any longer, right? Virginia's made a lot of money selling African Americans to Mississippi plantations. Literally being sold down the river comes from there, right? And we want to tell this story of Monument Avenue within the context of that. Another thing about Richmond that's quite fascinating is a sizable number of African-American slaves did not live with their owners, right? In large part because they worked in an industrial capacity. They worked in factories. And because they worked in factories, they had their own neighborhoods, right? The biggest building in Richmond for most of the 19th century was a black church called First Baptist Church. They rented it out to white folks. <laughs> Come think about that. Those are like geek out over stuff like this. Right? But you see what I'm saying? What we want to do is we want to tell them more enriching so they use the city as a museum. To tell these stories that very few people know, that they, 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 they chart the course of all this very complicated history. Right? And so that's what we're thinking. But we tried the museum round. They were like, uh-uh. No, nope, we don't want them. Right? Yes? To do? To deal with the monuments? I think you just deal with them on their own terms with, with, with kids that young. Not, not to monuments, but just history, like what would you pinpoint as the central focus for <coughs> one of the hardest things, history to One of the hardest things to do, um, and we're, I'm not sure we've agreed on when the age to do this is, is to construct and deconstruct the narrative at the same time. Right? How do you do that? Right? How do you teach narrative and say, well, this narrative is problematic? The people who are just trying to grasp right, the uh, story in the first place. And I think what you can do, or what, what, um, what people have tried to do in many ways is pick the right story. And that, at that phase in a child's intellectual development, deconstruction, I think, is actually going to work counterproductive to many of your objectives. I think picking the right story at a young age. We're, we're learning this, by the way, with my daughter, who's in elementary school. Virginia, to this day, still mandates that you have to teach the Civil War in a particular way. They still mandate the stuff about Lee. It is part of the curriculum, right? So we had to decide in fourth grade how we were going to deconstruct some of the stories the way they portrayed some of this history to this day. And I think 
my ultimate point is Virginia has struggled to pick the right stories even to this day. And I think picking the right story um, is, is critical. But one of the things we've done, just I will bend it toward the monuments if you don't mind, um, is we just asked young people just to think about like what position is Lee facing in? How is he postured, right? Just to think about the monuments, the actual works of art themselves, right? Because each one of the, there's some hidden symbolism in, in, in many Confederate monuments and young people usually pick up on it faster than anybody, right? It's like, why is he standing that way, right? Or why is he facing this direction? Or why is he, do, do, right? And, um, and then you can have, the, it's like, for instance, like uh, on Monument Avenue, Lee is facing uh, south. But Jeb Stewart is facing north, looking back, and Stonewall Jackson is facing north defiantly, right? And you can have these wonderful questions about, well, why would they do that? Um, but ultimately, back to your original point, I think picking the right story uh, to get students, young people, to, uh, um, to understand these complexities is the way to go at, at that age. We, we, we are literally being very cautious about the types of symbolisms and things that are in some of these issues. There's some really good stuff out there. Right. Does that answer your question? Yep. Yeah. Right. And then I'm also thinking I'm sorry, that was a recommendation, by the way. It's adding more monuments. For other people yes, yeah. absolutely. That is on the that is on the docket, by the way. But who? Yeah, exactly. My man. Oh, oh sorry, I couldn't see. Oh, my not man. <laughs> Sometimes we take we take for granted, yeah. right? How long ago the Holocaust was, right? And it's you know being a watershed moment in the evolution of human rights. Um, it's almost 100. We're moving on 100 years, right? You know, very few people recognize. There's actually a precedent for this. Like after the, the Second World War, there was no Holocaust memory immediately. The trauma of the event was too much for people to bear, right? So it takes time to emerge, but it's carried forward by the very people that you just said are dying. And we, and we run the risk if we don't carry it forward of the nature in which they created the Holocaust industry to carry that memory forward, right? Um, in a way that, that keeps it alive, right? I, I teach it and I, um, and, and I will continue to teach it, but it takes more than that individual initiative. Um, I'd be, I'm interested to see how this shakes out um, over, over the years. But there are a lot of institutional resources behind Holocaust uh, memory that I hope will be able to carry the banner forward as we, as we move on. Yeah. yeah. I don't think they're mutually exclusive at all, by the way. Those statues aren't the only artifacts in, in the South to Jim Crow. There's a pub, there are public school systems in pretty much every predominantly African American city in the South, or in other different ways. Right? What I meant when I said, um, you have to think what this means, um, what I'm about to say. What does it mean when a small handful of individuals are responsible for making the laws for nearly 75 years of the century? 
reads they write law to themselves, um, by themselves, for themselves, and for people like them. Meaning, meaning, by the way, that people were literally left out of the equation for most of the 20th century. So are all these artifacts the Jim Crow? You can talk about them by talking about state, modern state back. Because it's all wrapped up in the same nebulous vortex. You, you can't separate one from the other. Right? The very people who were responsible for those textbooks that I showed you were also responsible for systematically divesting in African American schools throughout the South for most of the 20th century. Despite the fact that African Americans paid just as many taxes as everybody else got half as much on their return. That's documentable. By the way, I'm low key making a case that if you want to make a case for reparations, it's probably made Jim Crow and not slavery because this stuff is all taxable. Right? I'm not saying I support that. What I'm saying is there's a paper trail. Right? Well, and, and, and I think we don't see it that way. We don't see all of our people what it is. And that's why I say it's important not to just think about segregation through the lens of race, but democracy. If you go to Virginia, you're going to constantly be bombarded with this idea that Virginia was central to the perpetuation of American democracy. Well, how, do you jog, how does that jive with all the stuff I just said? How does it jive with the fact that the Constitutional Convention of 1908 stripped 50% of whites of the right to vote, too? Right? Which means it, it had the lowest voter turnout out in the United States, some of the lowest one in the world. These guys rigged up a game for themselves. It is, it, it, they stole democracy. That's what they did. <laughs> it, it, it is pretty well documented that they did. Um, in broad daylight, those monuments are a representation of that, but they're not the only artifacts. I think you can have a conversation about all of this, right, um, without separating the monuments from it. I think the monuments actually serve as icing on the cake it's all the things I think that you're implying. You follow me on this? Right? Yes. So, I don't disagree. I'm sorry? I don't disagree. Sure. <laughs> Oh, you could explode anything. <laughs> right, you can, you can do all kinds of things. Let me ask you this. What would you do? I think we lack imagination when we think of all the things that we can do. What would you do to something as big as Stone Mountain? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what would you do? Well, I know. <laughs> but guess what? You might be surprised, like, how it is, right? I'm so, you know, there's like, digital? Would it be physical? You can do all kinds. What, I, what I'm saying is, don't ever let scale, right, impinge upon your ability to be creative. This is what I said on 60 Minutes. It's called, like, historical jujitsu. You use the scale and grandeur of those monuments against themselves. You push against the force. In fact, because Stone Mountain is so big, you can really play it off of itself. Does that make sense? Is that I think it's a deep lack of imagination. Like, we think scale neutralizes things. It doesn't in, in some way. 
The old blues players used to do this back in the day when they walk into, but I, I, I recommend this, by the way, as a teaching tool, it really works. When they walk into a venue and people were talking, instead of turning the music up, they turn it down. So everyone would know just how much they were talking and what was happening, right? That's the type of creative energy I think we need to bear on, we need to bear on things like Sundown. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Somebody, yeah, I'm doing the thing. Yeah. Um, how do you prevent struggles from people today from being kind of lost in history? You gotta keep the memory alive. I'll tell you one of the things we're struggling with. We're struggling with 20, late 20th century history, right? Because it is history now. Um, and I think um, what we are really struggling to do is explain how we got to now in the United States. That's, that's a big struggle, right? For all these complicated reasons, right? And I, I kind of brought this up with Joe Frazier. Let's, you got to think of the African-American story, for instance, as an immigrant story. The South was a foreign country for most of the 20th century. And African Americans are hightailing it out of there as quickly as they can, right? But then they get to these places and they find new challenges, right? I think we can know a lot more about cities like Philadelphia if we're honest about what happened to people when they got here. Which is, like I said, it's not to indict historical actors, it's just what happened, right? But if you know what happened, you're less likely to come up with these lousy explanations about why people are in the situation they are, right? I'd be a fool. Not to say, are some people who are poor responsible for their own poverty? Of course there are. Of course they are, right? But there are all kinds of people who've been systematically disinvested in the building box of upward mobility because of these historical forces. And it's impinged upon their ability to be decent American citizens. We can have, we can negotiate both these complexities at the same time. You follow me on this? You can't do it if you don't know the story, right? Yes. How does it measure progress, right, if you don't know where you began? That's one of the things I think we struggle with. We don't deal with the darker chapters of our history because we're embarrassed, right, or, or we just don't want to deal with them. But I think sometimes we really don't respect how much, look at this room, man. You would have never seen this 50 years ago, right? How do you respect what this room is if you don't respect what it, could, what it was 50 years ago? And you can't do that by glossing over history. You run the risk. Uh, we're not dealing with the darker angels of our nature, right, 50 years ago, of not really respecting the profound progress we've made in 50 years, but just how much further we have to go. I think we need to be realistic about who we were. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think we struggle with that. Americans struggle to deal. That's what Tocqueville was saying. You, can, you got two choices. You can, either, you can manumit these folks and treat them with some dignity, you can perpetuate their serfdom. We chose to perpetuate their serfdom, and this is where we're at, right? But he was, he was a visionary in his ability to see what the options were. And we know that now. And I think a lot of times when you bring up racial history, when you bring up controversial history, vulnerable history, people start getting uncomfortable. I'm, like, I'm not saying this to make anybody uncomfortable. I'm saying this in some ways as a delineation of where we've been, but also as a celebration of like how we got to now. And I don't think we really see that sometimes, because it, it makes it, people cringe when we think about some of the deeper atrocities that have been committed. Um, throughout this country's history, right? And it, it's because there's, there's, there are hard negotiations to, to, to deal with. But I do think when we deal with them honestly, um, when we face down history for what it really is and all of its beauty and all of its ugliness, we're a lot better off for it than otherwise, right? My question is not actually about the that in thinking about the history of the Sure. I feel like that's kind of a mirror to what happened in 2016. Well, you know, I think there are some really uh, pro profound. My father was a machinist, right, for 35 years, right? He was a UAW guy. He was a hardworking guy. And the day he walked off the production line, he said, Julian, that company is getting twice the production than half the labor force. We're being neutralized by automation and mechanization. I think we're not being realistic about some of the economic forces that are going on in the United States right now. I'll give you a perfect example. So I'm going to geek out with a little bit more history. Right? General Electric was the biggest tech company in the United States during the mid 20th century. They had hundreds of thousands of people on their payroll. The biggest tech company in the United States right now is Google. They have less than 5,000 people on their payroll. That's the story of economic employment. And, and, right? It's just like, how do, you do, how, do you, how do you structure an educational system to meet the challenges of unforeseen economies? 
right? Uh, especially in this day and age. I think what we're really dealing with is this kind of economic anxiety, like people who've been guaranteed, who as a birthright, upward mobility, and it's no longer there anymore, right? What hasn't been shipped overseas has been neutralized, right? That's why I like the movie Wally, right? <laughs> like all the human beings are fat and like, and like not doing anything. The computers are doing all the work. That's kind of a referendum on, right? There's a really good article by Derek Thompson in The Atlantic called The World Without Work. It, and I teach it. I taught it to her, right? And it's fascinating because it talks about exactly what you're talking about. You had your hand up back there? Yeah. Sir, um, I recently read uh, Edward Harris' Life of Freedom, and you talked about text books earlier, and there any other books you might recommend? Yeah, you want to send me an email? <laughs> I would literally bombard you with text books. No, I don't want text books. I want like actual books. Actual books? Like, yeah, I'm not going to So, I, yeah, there's some really good stuff out there. <laughs> right. Um, have you read the Taylor Branch books on the Civil Rights Movement? No. They're probably some of the best. Part of the Waters, what's the, uh, it, it's a good entry point, I think, the Taylor Branch books are. Um, but there's a really good book that just came out from Zora Neale Hurston called Barracoon, which talks about the last African that came to the United States on a slave ship. And boy, does it got some interesting things to say about who was responsible for putting him on that boat. Right? Oh, right, right. It's something we don't want to talk about. About who, right? Oh, yeah. It's something that's real touchy among certain folks in the United States. I don't want to open up that can of words, right? It really talks about who was responsible for slavery and the slave trade and how, right, and, and who, how the guy, um, his name was, uh, I can't think of his name, Koso or something like that. It's a really good book because it talks about the experience that Africans uh, in the Dahomey Kingdom, in what is um, uh, 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 now Togo, is it? Right? And their warriors had a, a huge role to play in some of these more controversial, controversial decisions that led to the rise of the slave trade. It's a really good book. That's the one I'm reading right now. Um, but the, the Taylor Branch books are really good. But, yeah? I'll talk all night, by the way. So you're going to have to shut me up. Yeah. <laughs> Both, I, right, I think you, you can actually, the Civil War, somebody, by the way, the Gatling gun was created. I don't know if that young man is in this room right now, in 1860. Um, uh, we, we were unsure about that. The Civil War was a deadly war, right? There's a reason why camouflage emerges in, right, not shortly thereafter. I think it's okay to like, have actual war memorials, so, right? Despite the fact that I, don't, I think they do very little to preclude us from getting into these conflicts repeatedly. But I, I think, it's also worthwhile to have um, depictions of the progress we've made around thought and beliefs, right, that have moved us beyond some of these deeply anachronistic ideas, right? I mean, you, you had no idea the kind of pseudo-scientific justifications and rationalizations that early, I mean, this all this sort of stuff that I haven't even talked about, right? I mean, Virginia embarks on this campaign of like sterilization, right? In the early 20th century, they sterilized thousands of people. Last until 1970, by the way. And you know, you a lot of that was all wrapped up in this stuff. There are all of these like counter, like these undergirding histories, if you will, that characterize this stuff. And I think you use those monuments to say, look how far we've come, right? And it was all about eugenics. It was all about social Darwinism. And it was all about the idea of trying to 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 breed better humans. And this is all kind of part of this, 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 this complicated history. And I think you use those monuments as a way to tell these stories. Because I don't think a lot of people are really aware of some of the things that we used to do to one another. This is when we talk about mental illness in that class, particularly. I mean, it would just appall people to know the nature in which, I mean, think about this. Like, this is the last thing I'll say. And this has nothing to do with Confederate monuments. But think about how ideology impinges upon, or, 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 or uh, uh, think about how belief systems um, influence the ways we organize strategies to meet challenges. How do you think, right, medieval Europeans would have dealt with severe schizophrenia? I can't see what they wouldn't have done. But what would they have done? Right, because they, they didn't understand. 
the human mind like we understand it now, right? That's what you use those things. It's like, look at how these people thought about it. That's what I meant when I, I meant what I said. People have lived and died on this planet believing in things that we know are patently false. And the same is going to happen to us. We need to use those as, 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 a, as, a, as an example to have those conversations. So we keep pushing the needle for right? Because it's been in some pretty dark places. But it's been some good ones, too. That's where I'm at. Does that answer your question? All right. I dropped my mic. All right, that's my cue. <laughs> Thanks for having me.